Good morning everybody. Well, it's getting colder, it's getting wetter. We're definitely moving towards winter now. Um, we're now looking at chapter three of Acts, the book of Acts. And as we look at chapter three, the subject matter in this chapter that's gonna require additional homework. So that's why I'm putting this video up earlier to give people a chance to do that additional homework. Let me just explain something. On a Sunday morning in our church, I believe, I'm a great believer in Bible teaching, but I'm also a great believer in Bible application. In other words, there has to be a challenge from the Holy Spirit to us all, not just knowledge, not just knowledge, but a clear challenge. And so on a Sunday morning, it is very important to have an application of what we're looking at and a challenge. And what is the Holy Spirit saying through it? Um, so particularly on a Sunday morning, you can't go into real depth. Now, where this course is going to be good is that midweek means that you're able to go into more depth and this week is definitely one of those weeks so uh, we're going to be looking at this a little bit more and it will require you to do a little bit more homework okay Acts chapter 3 verse 1 I love it where you've got Peter and you've got John and they're walking together they're going up to the temple beautiful they're going up to the temple for the hour of prayer. So my first question is, have you ever worked with somebody? Have you ever partnered up with somebody that's completely different to you and yet the Lord has used you both in a really mighty way? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever partnered up with somebody that's totally different to you but somehow you've really complimented one another? Okay, secondly then, I think when the disciples came down off the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus met the other disciples. They were trying to cast out a demon at somebody and they couldn't do it. Jesus rebuked them and he said, this kind doesn't come out apart from prayer and fasting. Now, there's a big difference between emergency prayer and accumulative prayer. In other words, that kind of getting into that pattern like Daniel. So my question is, here was Peter and John. What were they on the way to do in the temple? And why is that so important considering what's just about to happen? Okay, we're going to verses 2 through to 8. My question is very simple. Have you ever had a miraculous healing from the Lord? And can you describe, just share with the rest of the group what happened? And not only what happened, how it made you feel when you realise that what happened really was either bordering on a miracle or just an outright miracle from God. Okay, verses 9 through to 12. Amazing miracle happens. Epic proportions. Peter's response is incredible. What can we learn when the crowd come surging towards Peter. I explained this on Sunday morning. This was his moment, if you like, to seize control and become the absolute guru, if you like. <laughs> we know, of course, that Peter was not the first Pope, right? You don't need me to tell you that, but you know, if there was ever a moment to seize control and almost become the first Pope, this was it. Seize it, Peter. Seize this moment. 
take the glory for yourself you know lord it over the rest of them but what you see happening with peter is the complete opposite what can we learn about this for today and also morning hello <clears throat> thinks i'm nuts what can we learn about this for today and how different is this reaction from peter to what has become something of the norm why have we made celebrities out of servants of God? All right, let's move on to verses 13 to 16. I, I just, as, as a preacher, I find this quite staggering because um, what you see Peter doing here, these crowds are pouring towards him and the sermon that he gives them, <laughs> it's like, it almost just sends them the other way. So he, he literally points the finger. And in verses 13 to 16, can you see three ways in which Peter, through the Holy Spirit, convicted uh, the, the crowds, the Jewish crowds, of the, the very sin that they done only 50 days prior at Passover. Three ways, three ways in which he really nailed it. Okay, we're almost getting to the crux of the matter for this Zoom Bible study now. Verses 17 to 19, it talks about repenting so that times of refreshing can come upon the people of God. So my question is a very simple question but it requires you to be open and honest and sometimes people don't feel that they're in a, you know, a place to be able to do that. But if you feel as though you're in a place to be able to share like that, could you, ever, could you possibly share a time where as a Christian, you knew you had to repent and through that repentance came a a wave if you like a time of refreshing in your life where you rediscovered christ as your first love has that ever happened to you has that ever happened to you as a christian okay okay now now we're coming to the the main meat if you like of uh of this study just a couple of verses here which uh although they're only two verses they're huge these two verses are huge so it's verses 20 and 21 now of Acts 3. Now, we can't just look at these two verses. And the trouble is with uh, the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment, where we're open once a week. And to be honest, you know, we are just about coping with the, with the amount of people that are coming. Um, so we're having to do it like this in midweek. Now, verses 20 and 21 talk about the restoration of all things. Now, to, to grasp that, you've got to do some homework. All of us have to do it. We need to find time to do it. So here's the homework before Wednesday, before Zoom. Please read Romans chapters 9, 10 and 11. I know that's a lot. Well, that's not all of it anyway, <laughs> but please read Romans chapters 9, 10 and 11. Now, let me just say this before we go any further. There are denominations, there are churches that believe that the church has replaced Israel, that there's no need for Israel anymore. The church is the new Israel. And, uh, Really, one thorough good reading of Romans 9, 10 and 11 is enough for people that haven't been brainwashed to understand that that's just not true at all. 
the church has not replaced Israel. Now then, as we go through Romans 9, 10 and 11, we should see that there's always been a remnant, even in the days of Elijah, there's always been a remnant of Jewish people that have been faithful to Yahweh. And in the New Testament times, in our days, in the times of the Gentiles, there's always been a remnant of Jews that have embraced Jesus, Yeshua, <coughs> as their Messiah. So there's always been a remnant. But the restoration of all things is certainly more than uh, just a small remnant of Jews throughout the ages embracing Jesus as Messiah. So Romans 9, 10 and 11, we need to read it. Okay, the next thing we need to look at when looking at this subject is Revelation chapter 12. Again, the entire chapter. I know there's people in our church that are really busy, but trust me, you need to get your head around this because it's a big subject and it's time, it's time to understand these things. So Romans chapters 9, 10 and 11, once you've done that, don't just jump straight into Revelation 12, just think about it, meditate on it, write notes if you can, and then have a look at Revelation chapter 12, the entire chapter. Then, I know this is a lot to take in, but it's only a, a microscopic portion of the scriptures available for this subject. Once you've done that, Please read Matthew chapter 24, verses 14 to 30. Matthew 24, verses 14 to 30. So you should have read Romans 9, 10 and 11, Revelation chapter 12, and Matthew 24, verses 14, did I say? 14 to 30. And then finally, just a, excuse me, just a few scriptures from Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 13 verses 8 to 9 Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 Zechariah chapter 14 verses 1 to 4 and also Zechariah chapter 14 verses 8 to 9 Okay, now then with all this in mind and bearing in mind this is only a small portion of scriptures that deal with this uh, subject have a discussion together about the Jewish people about what you've learned from the scriptures in Romans 9 10 and 11 in Revelation 12 in Matthew 24 in the book of Zechariah when you bring start to pull all that together how is the remnant what is going to happen in the last days to the Jewish nation that's going to cause that surviving remnant to actually repent in order for times of refreshing to come upon them. How are they, how do they repent? What happens that causes them to repent? How do they finally embrace the Lord as their Messiah? And in what way does the life of Joseph typify this point? In other words, how does Joseph typify Christ in relationship to Joseph's brothers and of course the brothers of Jesus, the Jewish people? So have a discussion about that. I know it's a big topic, but it's the main topic that uh, I wanted us to look at in the Zoom meeting. You know, when Jesus left the temple at the end of Matthew 23, after proclaiming many woes upon the Jewish leaders, he said these words, you shall not see me again until I hear you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is going to orchestrate a sequence of events 
the times of Jacob's trouble that will bring a remnant, only a remnant, in the last days to a point where they actually cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're going to cry out for their Messiah. And we're going to see a whole swath of second coming prophecies being fulfilled at that time, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. These Jewish people will be so broken, so broken at that time. And they will see the one whom they have pierced and they will weep. And the Lord will pour out upon them the spirit of grace and supplication. It's going to be amazing, friends. It's going to be amazing. What Jesus does with the Jewish people right at the end of time, the remnant of the Jewish people right at the end of time, in a microcosm he has to do with us at certain times in our life because we become so stiff-necked and hardened. And the only way for us to acknowledge him again is to be broken. He does it in our lives and he's going to do it at the end of the time for the remnant of the Jews in those times, why only ever? Because he is love. That's God's pure motivation for whatever he does, love. So right at the end here then, if it becomes about winning the argument over winning the brother or the sister or winning the soul, I believe we failed. I really do. I believe that we should, you know, Bible study is all about coming together, loving one another, having grace with one another. Everybody comes at a slightly different perspective because of their background, because of what they've been taught, we do. And it cannot become about winning the argument. What it should be about is winning the brother or winning the sister and winning the soul. We don't know all things, folks. We don't know all things down here. We see through a mirror dimly. However, we have enough in the scriptures to be able to lift both hands up in the air like the Apostle Paul and say, from him and to him and through him are all things. He's the one that knows all things. He's the glorious one. What this should do when we read this kind of stuff is just leave us in adoration of him. God bless you. Next week we're going to be looking at the first taste of persecution for the early church and how they handled that. See you then.